It's time now for Word Alive from the Upper Room in Gatesville, North Carolina, with Pastor Eric Earhart. Join us in seeing lives changed by the power of God's Word. You're invited to join us in person on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. and Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. at 807 Main Street in Gatesville, North Carolina. You can also listen to our live audio podcast at www.ustream.com. And now, today's message. Is. In Jesus' mighty name, it is so. Amen. 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 Someone give the Lord a hand clap of praise, please. He's worthy. He's worthy of it. He's worthy of it. Um, in fact, before we get started, I think you should probably turn to your neighbor and tell him, you're going to be changed today. Go ahead and just bless them. Let, just speak that into their life. Amen. And if you're talking to your husband or wife, be careful how you say it. Say it with a grin. Say it really nice. You're going to be changed today, baby. Amen. Now you might want to turn to him and say, I'm going to be changed today. Amen. When we come to gather together, when we gather together as the body of Christ, you understand that we have people of all uh, persuasions, people at all different levels who gather together with us. People who love Jesus with all their heart, serve Him with every fiber of their being, and every time they screw up, they hit their knees and they fess up, and they say, Lord, I want to keep on moving on. Amen? I didn't, I, didn't want, I, didn't, I didn't want to put anybody on the pedestal here because even the most dedicated, tongue-talking, spirit-filled Christians screw up and have to fess up and get some uh, uh, freedom so they can keep on moving on. Amen? But, so we, we've got people sitting here today who are born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, and on fire for Jesus. Then we probably got some people sitting here today say, well, you know, I say I'm a Christian, but I don't really know what I believe. Amen? And everything in between. Everything in between. So what I would like to do when I come to gather together with the body of Christ is I want to believe. I want to believe that the Lord is sending the exact right people here today exactly who needs to be here. The exact right people right now are clicking on and tuning in and turning on and are going to listen to this message. Exactly the ones that Jesus needs to hear it is going to hear it. The ones that needed to dance and sing today came here today. Amen? The ones that, that have never seen anybody dance and sing. Amen? They need God knows right where you're at. He ain't abandoned you. He ain't left you. He hasn't forsaken you. He knows where you are, and He knows what you need. So when we gather together, I believe that no matter where you are in the spectrum of your faith journey, that you are going to be changed by the power of God's Word and Spirit. There's just no two ways about it. If you'll receive it, you'll get it. Amen? You, and now listen. Let's, let's be clear about the word receive. That it doesn't mean... The word receive in the Bible means that you will go after something. You'll hunger for it, you'll go after it, and you will make it your own. Amen? I've heard people say before that I'm going to get my blessing. That as the blessing of God's going by, I'm going to reach out and I'm going to get mine. What they're talking about is they want to receive from God. Amen? So today, I just wanted you to speak into the life of someone beside you. I want you to speak into your own life. I will change today. Amen? You're either going to get a little madder at God today, or you're going to get a little freer. But it, getting mad at God's okay too because then you can go home, you can fume a little bit, you can turn on your TV and flick through the channels, you get tired of that, discuss it and sit there and the whole time that Holy Spirit's just working. Just working. I don't know who that preacher think he is. Say that to me. I, I ain't even talk to you. I can't even see you with all these lights. I don't know who you are. But, but you go home be mad at me. I don't know who they think he is. And then finally when you lay your head on that pillow that night, the Holy Spirit will be like, no, 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 no. This is God, and I'm talking to you. And I love you, and I want you. Amen? Amen. Let's believe that. I will be changed today in Jesus' name. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise for that. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, I, I was so impressed um, Wednesday night, during the Wednesday night Bible study, and if you, if you haven't been attending those, or if you don't know about them, 7 p.m. Wednesday night, we have programs for the boys and girls. You come on out and get the word. I was so impressed by what God was ministering 
um, Wednesday night to me and, and through me and to all of us that I wanted to follow up on that. It was strong. It was a strong word, um, good word. And, and so we've been, I, I, in the month of June here, moving into the series Daddy's House. Uh, and we all know that Father's Day is contained within the month of June. If you don't know, praise God, I'm letting you know for the first time. Father's Day is contained in the month of June. You'll find it in there. Um, and, and so next week on Father's Day, what I want to deal with then is being sons and daughters. Amen? Being sons and daughters. So, so what I wanted to talk to you today about um, Daddy's house is the path to, to coming into the family, the journey to coming into the family, and the roadblocks that, that stop us from getting into the family of God. Amen? So I want to look at these things today, and um, um, the, the core passage that we're going to be hanging around today, I'm going to keep coming back to it, I'll come back to it several times, is going to be John 15, 16, and it's because Jesus is the door, you understand? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me, amen? If you can say amen to that, we're, we're, we're glad. He says, um, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, and fruit that will last. We're going to come back to this passage several times in this message, but I want to I want to lay a framework right now. I know that within the evangelical church, uh, throughout the body of Christ, oftentimes we talk about that that you have to accept Jesus, and that you um, need to choose to follow the Lord, and that you we put a lot of emphasis on you, but the Lord always puts the emphasis on Him. Amen. The Lord puts the emphasis on himself. And I love that he says here that you did not choose me, but I chose you. I remember when I was a blasphemer of the Lord, when I hated the mention of his name, and when I thought all Christians were hypocrites. God still had crazy folks coming up and witnessing to me. Amen? People sharing the gospel with me. People visiting in prison. People coming to my aid and my need, as Brother Arthur pointed out that in your low points, in your down times, when times when you didn't want anything more to do with God than the man on the moon, he still wanted something to do with you. Come on, give him a hand clap of praise for that. He didn't leave you nor forsake you. He reached out to you and he loved you first. You did not choose him. He chose you. Jesus said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. Amen? Now, what, what, what we dealt with on Wednesday night, I don't want to deal with it, but what did he choose us for? He says here to go and bear fruit, and fruit that remains. But what's, what's the deal? What fruit? What is he talking about? So we, we delve into that. We talked about the fruit of the Spirit and these different things. But I, what, what is it that he's choosing you for? What is it that, that, that he's reached down out of heaven? What is it that he, he, he bypassed all the things in your life, that he overcame all the obstacles in your life so that he could get to you and reach you first? and begin to pull you to Him. So what in the world is the deal with that? Well, it's the kingdom of God. He is coming to bring forgiveness. He's coming to bring release of your debt of sin. He's coming to release you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Amen? You see, in my former life, and I know uh, many of you can say the same thing, that there was a force of darkness inside of you that was so powerful. You couldn't overcome it. There was nothing you could do. There was no self-help programs. There was no 12 steps. Uh, incarceration, uh, uh, college, military service, none of these things could stop the force of darkness that was controlling my heart. I was out of control. I was out of control. It was nothing but the grace of God removing me from that kingdom of darkness and putting me in the kingdom of light that was able to change my life. It was only God reaching in and taking out the heart of stone and putting in a heart of flesh that released me from the sins that bound me. I didn't do that. I don't even think I really had any part in that other than crying out in my brokenness and weakness and just declaring that, that I'm broken and weak. And if you're there, I need you. That is the grace of God reaching you and bringing you into the kingdom. And I love this passage here. He said, For the kingdom of God is a, not a matter of eating and drinking. Somebody say amen. Why did I want you to say amen to that? 
Because too often we make the kingdom of God about the blessings that we get. We make it about what we receive and not whose we are. Amen. It says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating, drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's some, that's some good stuff. If you can grab a hold of that. See, because I, there, there was a time when I was a child and I looked at my dad and I said, I want to be a man like him. I thought that guy was awesome. I thought he was the tip top of there was. He was God in my eyes. And I wanted to be just like him. But as I began to grow up, I realized that my dad was an honorable man and I wasn't. Come on, somebody. And I realized I could not be him. I wasn't like him where he was able to keep his life together, raise his family, keep a job. I couldn't do none of the above. Hello? And all of a sudden, I realized that there was something missing in my life, that the man that I wanted to be, I couldn't be. Righteousness was missing from my life. Understand here, he says here, that it's not eating and drinking, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If there's nothing else that I have, and I appreciate Brother Arthur bringing this forth, if there's nothing else that I have in the kingdom of God, if I didn't have a nice house, I'd still have righteousness. Come on, somebody. If I didn't have a nice car, I'd still have some peace. Hello? And if I didn't have a beautiful wife and children, my life was still filled with joy. Glory to God. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise for that. Amen? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. This was what the kingdom of God is. So Jesus says, you didn't choose me. I chose you, and I chose you that you could bear some fruit, and fruit that remains. Fruit that remains. I, when I began to think about this, I was thinking, all right, God, so, so you, you chose us for what? What, the deal? what was the deal? To bring me into the kingdom, and what brings that? But forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins. It was the washing of my old life. It was the cleansing of my sin that allowed me to begin to walk in the kingdom of God. It allowed me to be ushered in. You see, the only thing keeping people out is sin. The only thing that can get people in is Jesus. And he said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. And so I thought about, hold on here. Lord, help me put this together. All right, so, so the issue is sin. And what I needed from you was the forgiveness of sin. So when you said you chose me, I didn't choose you, you were choosing to give me forgiveness of my sins. Huh? But then you said, Lord, but you want me to now go bear fruit, and fruit that remains. And I began to think about the roadblock in people's journey into the kingdom. And I, I remember in Mark 11 it says here, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone. Somebody say anything. Any and say anyone. Yeah, I want you to get a hold of this now. He says here, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything, come on, that's right, anything, against anyone. Anything against anyone. But what about the person that did me wrong? Anything against anyone. But what about the person that, name it, that's right, anything, come on. Anything against anyone. Wow, hold on Jesus, surely you don't mean this. Because Lord, did you see what they did to me? Did you see how they treated me? Did you see what they said to me? Did you see that? Ah, da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah. It says here, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them. So that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. So as we began to break this down Wednesday night, I, I tell you what, I, we were just, um, at first I thought maybe I had two heads. Because on Wednesday nights, I'm down in the floor with the crowd. I walk around. We enjoy each other's company. We get face-to-face -face and personal. We, we really break down the Word of God and we chew on it. But, but it was as if everybody in their chairs were like this. I was thinking, I, I like the late show here. Anything, listen, anything that comes on your TV at midnight and has got two heads, it's a monster. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. <clears throat> he says here, and when you stand praying, how many times have we called out to God and wondered, why is it doesn't seem like He's not answering? He's promised to never leave me. Or Come on. 
And when you stand praying, he said, and so many times we've, we've tried to walk with the Lord, we want to walk with the Lord, we, we're in and out of church, and we, but we just can't seem to get through the... I had someone say to me not too long ago, Pastor, I am trying hard. I really am seeking the Lord. I, I want to serve Him, but something just keeps seeming to block me. And as that person and I, in fact, I wasn't even... It wasn't even in the counseling. I was walking by that person one day, coming through the lobby of the church, and they were sitting there, and the Holy Spirit said, unforgiveness. I turned around and went back and, and uh, said, Brother, is it, are you dealing with some bitterness and unforgiveness? Well, yeah, and it just began to pour out of them. And I thought, wow. So this person, I've been watching this person for two years, trying desperately to be Christian. And struggling in and out and up and down. And all of a sudden come to find out that there's a roadblock in their spiritual pipeline. And it reminded me of one time and I went and preached a revival down in uh, Hatteras Island. And I went in that night and um, preached. We, it was a Sunday through Wednesday revival. By Wednesday the revival was going good. Things were breaking forth. People were just moving in the spirit. And they said, hey, can you go ahead and stay Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night? I said, sure, I don't have anything else going on. Um, I'll be happy to. So I stayed. And so when, uh, Thursday morning after the Wednesday night service, I'm at the altar in the, in the church and a little tiny uh, church there and, um, and, and Hatteras, a little assembly of God. And I'm down in the altar um, uh, Thursday morning praying and seeking the Lord for the message for that night. And the church board comes to me. And says, uh, Pastor, we, we want to take you to go pray for someone. I said, well, okay, what, what's going on? And they said, well, we have someone here that's uh, been a dear member of our congregation. In fact, she was the treasurer and the, um, uh, the house cleaning lady for the church for 13 years. She was here every day, loved this church, served this church faithfully, and, and she's not been in the church for three years because of sickness. And we want you to come pray for her. Now, I was a little angry, I'm going to tell you, because I just preached the night before on you got the power. Amen? And I'm thinking, listen, I just preached you got the power, why don't y'all go pray for her? And um, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me real quick and reminded me of Peter's shadow casting over people and people being healed. And, and that the people, when they saw the Spirit of God on Peter, they brought their sick out and laid them in the road that his shadow would pass over them and heal them, and it did. And the Lord spoke to me, and he said, they see me moving in you, now go with them. I said, all right, guys, I'll go. Let's, what do y'all want to do? And they said, well, we've we'll, we'll got to let her husband know that he can meet us there. It'll be a couple of hours, and we'll come pick you up. So they come and pick me up in this uh, um, vehicle. We all ride over there, the whole church board, the past church pastor. Um, we ride over there, and we get in, and the lady is laying in um, like a, a recliner with a footstool, and she's laying like this with unblinking eyes and totally stiff. And I said, what's wrong with her? They said, she's paralyzed. I said, paralyzed? They said, yeah. They said, she can't even blink her eyes. Her husband said he would have to close her eyes manually at night for her to go to sleep because she couldn't even blink her eyes. She was paralyzed. And I thought, what in the world? And I, Now, I've got to be, let me just be honest with you. Let me go ahead and I have a full disclosure moment with you. A little panic set in. I'm thinking... All right, Jesus, what am I going to do with this woman? I don't know what to do. And so I got on my knees and um, looked into those unblinking eyes. And I said, ma'am, I'm, I'm just going to believe God for a miracle here. I'm going to pray for you. And, um, and we're just going to see what God does. So I get on my knees. I'm touching her, praying, laying hands on her. I'm touching her, praying for her. And, um, and then finally, I... That was like, you know, I'm looking, again, I'm just being real with you. So I look over my shoulder, and the pastor and all the elders are standing over there, like waiting for me to do a miracle. And I'm like, Jesus, um, yeah, in the name of. And, and, and finally, I got a little angry. I said, you know what? I, I'm not, I'm not going to be afraid here. We're going we're gonna to see a miracle. So I got up, and I hit her with the Bible. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I got up and hit her with my Bible. And I said, and the Word of God says, and hit her with the Bible, and um, she was paralyzed, was, you know. <laughs> I figured she couldn't feel it. 
But now, I, listen, holy faith just rose up in me. And I, I said, you know what? I hit her in the head. And I said, in the name of Jesus, the Word of God is true, and we're going to believe for... And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just tells me, unforgiveness. I'm thinking, how do you say this? Now, how am I going to rebuke this paralyzed woman in front of her whole family and these elders and her pastor who's paralyzed? So now I'm the bad guy. I'm going to come there and tell her, you, listen, you woman. And the Holy Spirit says, unforgiveness. I thought, what in the world? And I just fall to my knees in front of her and I lay my Bible on her lap. And remember, she's in a, she's, she's in a um, lounge chair. And I get down and I, I get right there at her feet and I look her in the eyes and I say, dear, I said, all I can tell you is the Holy Spirit saying, you've got to forgive the same way He forgave you or you're going to die like this. I got up, looked at her husband, and I said, sir, get her best dress out, get the one she loves out and put it on her. She's coming to church tonight healed. And now the pastors and all and the elders are like, well, nothing's happened. And, and so the guy says, well, the pastor, because, of course, of course we, too often we walk by sight, guys. When things spiritual are going on, we walk by sight. And the pastor says, well, I'll send my suburban over, and y'all can lay her in the back. I said, that's not necessary. I said, she's going to be healed. She's going to come in tonight and be healed. And he said, well, I'll, I'll send a couple of elders to come and get her. Because he, he was looking at a woman who was still paralyzed and wasn't believing. But, but see, I had released something spiritual into her from the Holy Spirit. I, I, had, I had released an atomic bomb of the Spirit onto that roadblock. Now sometimes a bomb has a fuse and it has to tick, 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 tick before that thing can explode. So the work of the Holy Spirit had yet to be done. It was going to be unleashed in a moment in her life. And I could feel by faith that this roadblock of unforgiveness was going to be busted. And so we were in there worshiping that night, and it was, it's the Buxton Assembly of God. I hear, still hear about people talking about that, um, that miracle. And we're in there worshiping, the praise team is worshiping, and I'd ask the praise team to do uh, um, Where There Is Faith. And so we're singing Where There Is Faith by, for Him, and we're jamming, and all of a sudden, I hear like an audible, oh. And then I hear the place erupt, and the clapping and praising. And I turn around and look, and here she is walking down the aisle. You see, this dear saint of God, this woman who loved Jesus, her only son was a DOT worker and had been run over by a drunk driver one rainy night. And the man only got a two years in prison for taking her only son's life. And she had decided right then and there, I can never forgive that man. And then Jesus said, then I can't forgive you. You see, the Word of God is clear that the root of bitterness works not only to hinder your walk with Christ, but it makes you physically sick. It defiles your whole body, the Word of God says. He says here the roadblock, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything, somebody say anything, against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in Heaven may forgive you your sins. Wow. But see, then something happens after that. When you forgive, when you release, when you, when you just declare, should we, we, we had shared Wednesday night, I'd share something that my wife had went through, actually the, the night before, the day before, um, in a public uh, uh, place where some people shunned her openly, acted as if she didn't exist, when she went up to them to hug them and say, hi, how are you doing? We've missed you. And she said they acted like they couldn't even see her and walked right by her. And she's going like, what, what have I done? And unforgiveness and bitterness in these people had caused them to act as if she didn't even exist. So she calls me crying. And she says, um, what have I done? I said, you've done nothing. She said, but why would they treat me like that? I said, they're mad at the church. And I said, they need to find forgiveness in their heart. It doesn't matter if someone's really done you wrong or you just think they have, you better find some forgiveness in your heart. 
So she began to search her own heart. My wife begins to say, well, but, but if I, and she, and then she began to beat herself up. What have I done? What have I done? And I said, hold on, wait, whoa, whoa. Stop right there. In the name of Jesus, right now, you will forgive yourself and you'll forgive those people. Because you are not going to let a spirit of condemnation come on you because someone else has unforgiveness. Come on, somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Sometimes you've got to forgive yourself so that you can then turn around and forgive anyone of anything. Amen? You've got to be free. This is, what, this is about coming into the Father's house. It's about coming into the kingdom. He said, I chose you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you to go bear fruit. So what did He choose me for? He chose me to give me forgiveness. The only thing that human beings need is forgiveness. The only thing we need is to be released from the bonds of sin. The only thing we need to be is released from condemnation. Isn't it amazing? Jesus had to go into this great parable about a, a beam in your eye and a speck in their eye because we're mighty good at judging others. We're mighty good at looking at their sins and, and, and building this case against them in our mind. And in, in, in Revelations 22 and 7, it says, or 17, it says that, that no one who loves and makes a lie will enter in to the kingdom of God. But I found this out, that there's no way that I can remain in unforgiveness towards you or anyone else without making up lies in my mind about them. Oh, you better let that one sink in. I, I, have, to, I have to manipulate and think in what they did and they said. And I have to begin to impose judgment upon their motives and their actions that I begin to make a lie in my mind about that person. That's the only way I can stay unforgiven towards you. You see, because the truth is, the only thing I need from Jesus and the only thing you need from me is forgiveness. Nothing else matters. The only thing I need to do is walk in that forgiveness. That's walking in the kingdom. Remember, it was righteousness. Oh, come on. Peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. How am I going to be righteous if I don't forgive you? How am I going to be at peace if I'm walking around? And I certainly ain't going to have no joy. There ain't no two ways about that. The only way to walk in the kingdom of God is to walk in the forgiveness. But that makes absolute sense. Jesus said, I chose you. You didn't choose me. What did you choose me for, Jesus? To forgive you, Eric. Come on, somebody get a hold of this. I chose you to forgive you. That's all I chose you for. And by me forgiving you, releasing you from your debt, releasing you from your sin, you can now walk in freedom and peace and joy. You can enter into the kingdom. Wow. How many of us are walking in condemnation of ourselves and of others? We're in a roadblock in our walk with Christ. We want more, but we can't seem to get more. We can't figure out why in the world I love Jesus, but I can't. And he said, forgive anything from anyone. Wow. I remember one time I was um, incarcerated like my dear friend, Brother Arthur. Man, this is the Penitentiary Church. What's up with this? Praise God. I'm sure glad we got a couple of cops in the house today, huh? We'd be unbalanced or something. What's up? Um, I'm sitting in there, and, and the uh, young lady that um, uh, was uh, my girlfriend on the outside of the prison, she, she took all my money, took all my stuff, furniture, everything, sold it, and took off to Texas and had a party with all my goods while I was in um, um, prison. So I lost everything, and, and she stuck a few of my personal belongings into a um, storage unit. And because, of course, I'm in prison and can't pay for that storage unit, it was gone. So I'm talking photographs. I'm talking mementos. My, my grandmother's immigration papers from South Africa to Ellis Island, New York in 1908. Simple, beautiful little things like that. My grandfather's bayonet from World War I. Just things that were mementos uh, of, uh, of my family heritage and of my life. Gone. Everything. So, so that, that I'm sitting there incarcerated, have lost my freedom, and now lost everything, even little things like photo albums and stuff like this that meant everything. And, and of course, a spirit of bitterness and hatred wanted me to, uh, to, to, to uh, want to begin to foment all these thoughts against this woman and, and begin to, to hate her in a way that was going to cause deep resentment and bitterness. And on top of it, when, when I talked to her about it on the phone and called her up, she said, number one, don't call me no more. And uh, number two, I don't like you threatening me. I said, I'm not threatening you. I want to know, can you go get my stuff out of the storage unit and take it to my parents' house in, in Virginia? 
And I'm not doing any such thing, so it was left. So what happens next is I get a visit from the mod squad. Well, if you haven't been to prison, and I pray you haven't, the mod squad is guys that come dressed in helmets and vests and things like this, and they come with shackles to take you out of your cell. Well, what in the world is going on? Oh, they've gotten a phone call that I had threatened to escape from the prison and go kill this lady. So now I'm being shackled up and led out by the mod squad, taken to the prison in the prison, which is the hole. Come on, y'all remember the song, 30 Days in the Hole. And now I'm thinking, I haven't done anything. I'm just trying to love this girl and forgive her. And, and I'm going, what, what's going on? And the Lord just taught me to forgive and release. Let it go. And he said, Eric, without me, you're no different than her. Huh? What, God? Without me, you're no different than her. So a couple of years later, she decides to come visit me at prison. I guess she was wondering what was going on, and she comes to the prison. They bring me out to the visitation yard, and I'm sitting down, and um, she had a stab wound. She was a stripper at a, a bar, um, and she had been stabbed in a bar fight. She had some bruises on her, and, um, and I just said, you know, I just pray for you. I pray for you so much, and and she said, um, why don't you hate me? I said, I'm not going to, you can't, listen, I said, listen to this. I said, you can't make me hate you. You can't make me hate you. I choose love and I choose forgiveness because he's given me love and forgiveness. And there's nothing you could ever do because if you could make me hate you, you could control me. Come on, somebody say amen. If you could make me hate you, if you could beat me spit on me, throw me down. If you can make me hate you, you can control me. But because Jesus controls me, love and forgiveness are the control He uses. Glory to God. And I looked at her and I said, you know what, I just forgive you. I said, I love you and forgive you. And she started crying and she said, don't you believe the Holy Spirit can change me the way He's changed you? And I said, yes. Yes, I do. Anyone, anything, anything, anyone, when you stand praying, forgive them of their sins so your Heavenly Father can forgive you. Now remember this. Now, I, I, now what we talk about is now the fruit that comes out of this. I, and this is what we're going to close with. Jesus, remember, remember the text now. You didn't choose me, I chose you. All right, Lord, you chose me. What did you choose me for? Forgiveness, Eric, gotcha. All right, you chose to forgive me. But then he says, but I chose you for forgiveness so you can do what? Go and bear fruit and fruit that remains. Aha. Uh -huh. So we see here that the fruit of the Spirit is, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these, there is no law. Wow. You notice that there was no real actions declared here. He, it, he didn't say the fruit of the Spirit is feeding the poor. Come on, somebody. He didn't say fruit of the Spirit is witnessing to others. He didn't say the fruit of the... He gave no actions here. What did he give? He gave a display of what a truly forgiven person looks like when they offer that to others. Ah, come on. I chose you. You didn't choose me. And I chose you what to forgive you. And then to go bear. Come on, somebody. You understand that bearing something, you ain't producing it. You haven't created it. All you're doing is carrying it. When you bear something, you're carrying it. I remember when I was in the Army, I was a machine gunner, M60 uh, A1 machine gun, had 400 rounds of ammo, backpack, helmet, uh, and I had an assistant gunner. My assistant gunner, we called him Baby Doc Devalle. I don't know if you all remember the ruler of Haiti, a guy named Baby Doc back in the uh, 80s and 90s, but this guy looked just like him. He was like five foot nothing, about 125 pounds, and why in the world the United States Army chose to make him an assistant machine gunner makes no sense to me. Because we had an 80 pound pack, and we had pistol belts, we had ammunition, we had guns. Now this little guy had to carry his rifle, his pack, his stuff, and carry a spare barrel for the machine gun and the tripod that the machine gun would sit on. 
This 115, 125-pound guy was carrying about 140 pounds of gear. And so one day we're on a 10-mile road march, and we're going through the woods, and I don't know if you've ever been through the woods like this, but you go up and down the hills, and you get to creeks and muddy zones, and you've got to change the azimuth on your car, and you're going and going and going. And all of a sudden I started noticing that when, when we would, the, 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 the 125, 30 men of the company, as we'd go through the woods, we would begin to accordion as we went up and down hills, and, and we would bunch up, and then we'd have to just stand and wait while the next, the other guys ahead of us finally got going up the hill and we could finally go in. And so this whole time, and you're, you're with all this gear, and every time we would stop, I would notice that the baby doc would just grab a tree and, and hold on to it, and, and he couldn't hardly go. And so finally I said, listen, throw your M16 and the spare barrel and the um, tripod up on top of my uh, rucksack. We'll strap them down up there, and you just grab a hold of my rucksack and keep a watch of my feet. <laughs> when I stop, you stop. And when I go, you go. And so I had Baby Doc put all his stuff on top of my backpack and then grab a hold of it so I could drag this guy through the woods. And then whenever we would stop, I'd hear him start going... <laughs> he was so exhausted and so dehydrated, he would literally just pass out. Right after that, actually after that movement, after we were 30 days, I think 30 days in the field, um, they moved him to being a clerk, praise God, which was the smartest thing they'd do because uh, he was a dear friend. Now listen, this little guy, we ate together, slept together, climbed in the same sleeping bag together, dug our hole and sat in the mud together. We, we did everything together and hung out together. And, and he was more than a, a, a member of a unit. He was my friend. He was my brother. And I thought nothing of bearing his burden. Come on, somebody. I thought nothing of it. He said here, I chose you. You didn't choose me to go and bear fruit. Bear what fruit? Of forgiveness. You understand the fruit of the Spirit is not yours. It's His Spirit. Come on. The fruit of the Spirit is not your fruit. It's His fruit. You are to... Come on, you're getting it. You bear that fruit to others. I'm forgiven, I'm loved, and so I bear the fruit of forgiveness and love to you. Why? Because the only thing human beings need is love and forgiveness. We have to be released from our sin debt. Has someone sinned against you? Of course they have. Release them. Let them free. Your arm is like a hook up in their back. And you've got to pull that thing out and say, go free. I release you. That is the only way you can walk in the kingdom of God. I want you to remember, you didn't choose Him. He chose you. You might have come forth and said a prayer. You might have went into the water and got baptized, but it was only because the love of God was extended to you. The forgiveness of Jesus Christ came out to you. He chose you. Now go and bear some fruit of forgiveness in someone else's life. In Jesus' name. Give Him a hand clap of praise today. This is what I'm going to ask you to do. Our elders are going to come forth. They're going to offer their services to pray for you. If you just say, listen, I, I just need someone to pray for me, Pastor. I'm, I'm feeling a little convicted here. i got someone I need to let go. I need to forgive them. Or I need to forgive myself. we got people here that will pray with you, man. They'll pray confidentially. They'll, they'll encourage you. They'll grab a hold of the kingdom of God with you. You just come up and let some elders pray with you. Amen? And if you don't, you say, well, I don't, I'm okay, I'm good, i got a good message, I'll go home, I'm mad at you right now, Pastor, I'm going to let the Holy Spirit work on me tonight. Good, 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 good. But before you leave here, you hug someone and tell them you love them and thank them for being here, okay? Let's pray before we go. Father, in Jesus' name, I release the blessing of forgiveness on this congregation and all those watching, oh God. Release us from our sin debt, Father. Forgive us. For the name and sake and blood of Jesus. And allow us, oh God, to go and bear that. Bear it like it's on a silver platter. That forgiveness and that grace to others. In Jesus' name. And everybody else who agreed said amen. And amen. God bless you as you go. Thank you for being here today.